Well, we're going to take a look today at one of the things that I've, uh, I've talked to you about a couple of times, and that's the idea that history, uh, unfortunately, we treat it like Legos. It each has its separate parts, when in fact, of course, there is no way that they are separate. They're constantly interacting, constantly influencing uh, the trends that, that take place in, in each of their areas. And the area of foreign policy is absolutely no exception. Many of the things that we've talked about uh, in the last few lectures, for example, uh, the rise of big business or uh, progressivism or populism or farmers or uh, whatever the case may be, has a direct impact on policy is going to be and vice versa. Take a look at today, for example. Uh, you have Trump in, a, in an undeclared uh, economic war with China. And that is a direct impact and vice versa was directly impacted by America's farmers and some of her businesses who claim unfair competition from China. And this has been going on for quite some time. Take uh, Russia and Putin uh, interfering in our elections and trying to undermine the democratic process. And of course, this is a, a direct result of America challenging uh, Russia successfully in an era that was called the Cold War and now Russia under Putin uh, trying to get back uh, on an even keel, if not ahead of the United States. So these things go on all the time. Unfortunately, they sometimes lead to war. In my era, of course, it was Vietnam. In your era, it's Iraq, it's Afghanistan, and uh, a, a ton of other places that uh, small brush fire wars, as they're called, take place. So we're, we're going to take a look at those today, and we're going to take a look at the beginning of an ism. History is filled with isms, militarism, colonialism. But today, we're going to take a look at... You take a look at the cartoon there at the bottom, you will see there the caricature of Uncle Sam. And he's holding a piece of paper that says trade treaty with China. And as you'll see there at the bottom, the various caricatures which represent the other big powers in the world, whether it be Great Britain, France, Germany, Italy, the list goes on each of those with a pair of shears or scissors, cutting up China, if you will. All of a sudden, we decide to get involved in what becomes known in some circles as the Great Game, popularized by a, a number of different authors of that, of that particular era. So we're gonna take a look at how the United States got involved in that Great Game and how we became a world power. <laughs> Of course, one of the things that is a, a stalking horse for that great power is what you see right there uh, in the picture. There is the battleship, the USS Maine, who's going to become extremely famous uh, in a short period of time. But at that time, she was part of something that will later be called the Great White Fleet. When you take a look at aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, uh, guided missile frigates, uh, and again, the list goes on. These are a way for countries to project their power. You get to see uh, America's power up close and personal. If you're in a port, maybe it's in England, or maybe it's in somewhere in the Mediterranean, or perhaps in the Pacific. And that's how we can project our power without us ever really leaving home. Take, for example, uh, air shows. I don't know if any of you have ever been to any of the flyovers or the air shows down in uh, Atlantic City. They have those all over the world, and we are a participant. Why? Well, for a very simple reason, and that, of course, is to project our power, to let you see, without getting too up close and personal, what the world has. But 
There's a price to pay for that power. When you're at the top of that thing, somebody's always trying to knock you off. Whether it's us trying to reestablish ourselves on that mountain by putting the flag on top of Mount Suribachi. How do we get there? Let's take a look. The necessity for strategic naval bases has fueled American expansion for over a century. Baker, Jarvis, and Howland Islands were used as aircraft way stations between Hawaii and Australia. Some territories were secured for other reasons. The Virgin Islands were purchased for their strategic location near the Panama Canal, and the United States instituted the Cuban naval bases. In that same year, the acquisition of Hawaii allowed for the emergence of the infamous Pearl Harbor. Whether ceded through war or purchased for strategical purposes, the acquisitions under the American expansion have resulted in the growth of a nation. Now, why did we want all these islands? What made us leave our, our shores? Remember, for a long time in early American foreign policy, we were bound and tied to isolationism. We didn't need anybody else. All of a sudden, that was about to change. George Washington, in his famous farewell address, made a statement which was misinterpreted for the longest time. Take a look. Why, by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice? Now, this idea of entangling alliances, many people, for their own purposes, uh, interpreted Washington as saying that we should remain huddled within our shores. And that was not his point at all. All he was saying was, for the time being, we need to create our own strength inward, and then we'll be able to go out. But be that as it may, isolationism was the uh, driving policy or the driving idea behind much of our policy for a long, long time. But that would start to change. Now, let's take a look at that first phrase, to preserve the national interest. Keep this in mind. When you're talking about foreign policy, you never, ever, ever do anything for nothing. Whether it's we're sending aid to uh, nations that are experiencing starvation, disease, a pandemic, let's say, or uh, let's go to 2006 when a tsunami uh, wrecked its way across the Pacific hitting islands uh, throughout Indonesia and, and other areas. Why did we give aid? Well, stop and think about it. I mean, obviously, there's uh, altruistic motives. We want to help people. But bottom line is the United States, or as Iran refers to us as the great Satan, was giving aid to the largest Muslim nation in the world. And that, of course, is Indonesia. So, is there a method to our madness? Absolutely. No entangling alliances for a while was in our best interest. That was going to change. With the War of 1812, we develop a, fury, a period of uh, nationalism, extreme pride in our country. And when you're prideful, you want to compete. Monroe Doctrine becomes our first official foreign policy, where we caution European powers to stay out of our backyard in the Western Hemisphere. We couldn't back it up, 
but at least that was the idea, which we still use today. And then we are beset with manifest destiny. The idea that we're going to expand from sea to shining sea. But of course, that dealt with the inner United States. How would that be used as we start casting our glance outside of our own borders? You'll see in the 1850s, Admiral Perry is going to sail into Tokyo Harbor with a fleet of American ships around 1850, 1851, and demand that Japan open up her borders to the industrial nations. And within a very short period of time, Japan is going to join those industrial nations. We'll turn back inward during the Civil War for obvious reasons, but after that, and because of it, because the Civil War is going to fuel our industrial expansion, we are now going to take uh, a rather jealous eye and cast it towards our boundaries. Dollar diplomacy, dollars, big, big dollars are involved. So why then? Well, number one, the need for markets. As we grow our industries, the desire to sell more and more overseas is going to increase. We need raw materials for the products that we wish to produce. And we had a lot of excess money to invest. It's going to be announced, and we've talked about this when we talked about uh, Turner's Frontier Thesis, that the frontier was closed. Uh, America's westward expansion was at a standstill, or so we thought. So now we start looking to expand overseas. Why? Well, go back to the beginning, need for markets, et cetera, et cetera. We see the European examples and what they've done, and we wish to proceed in playing in the great game. American nationalism is on the rise and we wish to compete with the other growing powers. Take a look at the graph. And there you'll see our foreign investments in a, a 40 year time period. We go from 100 million to now we're in the billions. And again, that money creates opportunity, which leads to the desire for more opportunity, which leads to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes a never ending cycle. This man. What kind of man are you anyway, you right? A oh, dangerous one. Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan, an instructor at West Point, the United States Military Academy is going to publish one of the most influential books in all of world history. The title of the book is about, though, 15 pages long. I exaggerate, but if you take it and cut it down, he talks about the importance of sea power. All great nations, he maintains, achieve that greatness through sea power. If you wish to be a great power, you need a great Navy. Countries throughout the world are going to read this. And now an arms competition, or as we would later call it, an arms race begins, and we are going to join it. You will see right there an example of his book, The Influence of Sea Power. Take a look there at the Pacific and then the Caribbean. And look at all of the possessions that we all of a sudden are going to accrue after the Civil War, beginning with Midway Island in 1867, and then the list goes on. Now, why? Why do we want Palmyra Island, or Baker Island, or Jarvis Island? What's the purpose of those? Well, stop and think about it. What fueled America's ships? And it was no longer wind power. It was steam power. And what do we get steam from? Well, of course, coal. Coal became the fuel. So you needed 
each and every one of these islands as coaling stations. It was like they were gas stations where you could go and take your ship, fuel up, and then continue to export or show your power in other places in the world. And of course, over in the Caribbean, well, what's the reason for us being there? And that's going to be to protect what we will talk about soon, the construction of the Panama Canal. So you see the islands, you see America uh, projecting its power with the use of the coaling stations throughout. And again, this was to be able to extend our fleet. Nineteen eighteen eighty nine, American Samoa, which by the way, we still have today. 1892, we're gonna get involved in a problem in Chile. 1893, we are going to take over Hawaii. 1895, we intervene in Venezuela. And then of course, the Spanish-American War. <laughs> That's simple. Uh, a man by the name of Robert Dole, D-O-L-E, Dole, and that should strike a chord with some of you, has a huge pineapple plantation on Hawaii. He wants to take over Hawaii and stem the nationalism of the last queen of Hawaii, Lili Lukalani, who you see standing there. So, he claims that the islands are being mismanaged and he demands American intervention. Remember, dollar diplomacy. We're going to favor big business. So, the United States Marines are sent into Hawaii. The United States Navy uh, is going to park itself right there in Pearl Harbor and we will take over the Hawaiian Islands. Remember, this wasn't voluntary on their part. We just take it over. But that's exactly what the great powers were doing. The Reverend Josiah Strong, an evangelist, would preach the advantages of Anglo-Saxonism. And of course, this simply meant, uh, as some people would characterize it, as the white man's burden. It is our job, no, it is our duty to export the advantages of our civilization, our religion, our culture. Of course, we use that same uh, thinking to justify what we did to the American Indian. And now we're gonna do the same thing as we expand overseas. Albert Beveridge, who would, of course, later start a soda empire, <clears throat> uh, believed in social Darwinism. Social Darwinism, of course, as you know what Darwinism is, only the strong or the fittest survive. And so it is also with human beings. And then James Blaine. Blaine believed in the big sister policy, which, of course, meant that we were simply acting as a big sister to the other poorer nations of the world as we insisted on helping our little sister. Now, of course, in this social Darwinism will be a number of racist theories, eugenics, if you will. There are certain races that are superior to others, and it then becomes the white man's burden, as you see Teddy Roosevelt carrying our old brown brother up to the civilized schoolhouse. Again, the exact same thing that we're gonna to do to the American Indian as we intend to naturalize them and inculcate them into the American way. And that is how we and other nations justified the things that we are about to do. Take a look at that picture there on the left-hand side. American missionaries in China in 1905. They're using the Chinese as human taxi cabs or Uber drivers, if you will. Uh, 
You see the smile on the one. Uh, again, it's this idea that they are inferior. But now this is for religious reasons. We are going to, again, uh, bring our superior religious beliefs and force them upon the, the peoples who are, of course, heathens and pagans. But there you see the same concept as the caricatures of England, Germany, and of course, leading the way is Uncle Sam are on the backs of the various natives. This is all going to lead us to the Spanish-American War. We're going to take a look at the Spanish-American War, which began in 1898. We'll take a look at the causes of the war and the various outcomes of that war. This is going to be our first real venture into an imperialist realm. Cuba, which of course sits 90 miles off our shores and is still uh, a source of controversy today. During the Obama administration, of course, uh, we made amends with Cuba, which had, of course is communist. Uh, then under the Trump administration, uh, we put the fences back up. Now the whys and wherefores of that we'll discuss much later. But Cuba was extremely important. It had been for a while. We had tried to buy Cuba from Spain prior to the Civil War and make it a slave state. Of course, uh, that resulted in a letter called the Ostend Manifesto, um, which was an embarrassment to the Democrats. But more about that later. Cuba is important for economic reasons. It becomes important for humanitarian reasons as we look at the quote unquote mismanagement and the uh, horrific crimes that are being forced upon the Cuban population by their Spanish overlords. And there's a cry to get involved. But of course, we also fear the loss of US property. If you've ever seen the uh, movie Godfather II, you will see that very thing as the mafia with their casinos down in Cuba uh, are fearful of a communist takeover and try to help John F. Kennedy get rid of Castro. But then the advent of yellow journalism, or as Trump likes to refer to it as fake news, is going to take place. And that is going to help push us into war. Now, what exactly was yellow journalism? Take a look at this cartoon. There it is, over the fires of anarchy, you know, the, out of the uh, frying pan and into the fire. There's poor Cuba in the frying pan of Spanish misrule about to be burned up in anarchy. And this is the type of thing that was shown to the American people. But the two individuals responsible for this are two newspaper owners and editors, both of them competing for the, uh, the rather uh, large market in New York City. Joseph Pulitzer, again, foreign born, Joseph Pulitzer, who of course, today's Pulitzer Prizes are named after, Pulitzer Prize for Literature, uh, Pulitzer Prize for uh, various and sundry other writing prizes, all right? And then you have William Randolph Hearst. These two are constantly competing for readership. Back in those days, advertisement, which is the sole source of survival for uh, print journalism today. But back in those days, it was not. It was sales, selling newspapers, selling magazines. That's what brought in the money. And so you had to outstrip the other, outreport the other out sensationalize the other if you wish to uh, take control of the market. And war was one way to do it. And these two would be competing as to who could cover a war. Thus became a literary battle known as Yellow Journal. Now, 
Why is it called yellow journalism? Take a look in the bottom right-hand corner. I might have that on the next slide. Yes. There he's known as the Yellow Kid. And the Yellow Kid was the first ever cartoon or comic strip in color in the newspapers. Uh, he was in Pulitzer's newspapers, and it helped him sell a lot of paper. Well, William Randolph Hearst was not going to put up with that. So, rolling, 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 rolling buys the cartoonist who did that strip and brought him over to his newspaper. So it was this, this war, if you will, for the yellow kid. Well, now they took it to another level. The sensational headlines, the uh, cartoons that were drawn purporting to show the, uh, the awful goings-on down in Cuba. And all of these, of course, attracted readership. So this became known as, again, this battle between Hearst and Pulitzer and other newspapers as yellow journalism. As William Randolph Hearst said, you give me the pictures, I'll create work. So there you see one of the uh, editorial cartoons that was drawn supposedly by a reporter down in Cuba, uh, the mass execution of Cuban revolutionaries. This never took place. This was never seen. This was, in fact, fake news. But a story was attached to it, uh, amping up the, the fever for war. This particular picture of the General Valeriano Weiler, who was the uh, Cuban governor, or the Spanish governor, I should say, of Cuba. They called him Weiler the Butcher, as you see there. And he's trying to chip away at the Cuban people. He supposedly had concentration camps where he placed Cubans by the tens of thousands who resisted his rule. He called it reconcentration. This is a picture, and it is accurate. This is not uh, an example of fake news of some of the inhabitants of those reconcentration camps. So once again, it would be these pictures that uh, amped up the call for United States intervention. Again, the humanitarian needs that are being fostered by this yellow journalism. So all that was needed was an event. And that event would be known as Remember the Name. Remember the Name was a, it's an iconic battle cry. And what it involved was that. Now, the USS Maine, part of the Great White Fleet. America's Navy, courtesy of Alfred Thera Mahan's policies. The Maine was sent down into Havana Harbor in order to um, protect American property. Well, the mayor of Havana invites the uh, sailors and officers of the Maine to a party on, on land. They all go, leaving behind a skeleton crew to maintain the Maine. Now, the main, of course, eventually blows up. Of course, yellow journalism says, well, it's the result of a Spanish mine that was attached to the hull. When in fact, after it was dredged up, it was found out that an American sailor had decided to uh, sneak a cigarette in the powder magazine. So he goes down there, lights a cigarette, and of course, lights the main, if you will. Then shortly thereafter, you see there in red, the DeLone letter. Dupe DeLone, American ambassador, or Spanish ambassador to the United States, writes a letter back to uh, the King of Spain, calling the United States, if you will, the Pillsbury Doughboy. 
uh, that we're soft, don't worry about us, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So after that insult and after the blowing up of the thing, there is a cry for war. Yellow journalism. There you see the cartoon. There is the Spaniard with his blood dripping knife behind his back. And there's poor Uncle Sam handcuffed with his hands behind his back. What should he do? After the DeLome letter, now there is a cry throughout the United States for war. McKinley is betwixt and between. What should he do? Should he get a new suit, which puts him in the realm of an imperialist, one who uses war or other means to uh, put his control in effect? Or do we remain peaceful? And eventually what happens, of course, is McKinley will declare war. McKinley claims that God spoke to him in a dream and that God told him to go down into Cuba. So once again, as you're going to see uh, in a few more years, God supposedly speaks to the people in power and they are but doing the will of God. Now, Congress has some people who feel that this is outright imperialism, that we have no good reasons for going to war. So other congressmen, in order to show that we have nothing but altruistic uh, and noble intents, passes the Teller Resolution. And what did the Teller Resolution say? It was attached to our declaration of war, and it said the United States rejects any and all possibilities of getting any territory as a result of this war. We are not in it for any other reason but to help the Cuban people. Keep that in mind. Secretary of State John Hay calls this a splendid little war, a chance to expose America's growing power. So war is declared with Spain in 1898. And Uncle Sam now has to get his fleet to Cuba. Not so easy.
he asked, the glories of war. The Assistant Secretary of the Navy at this time uh, is Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt believes that whenever the Secretary of the Navy goes out to lunch, well, that kind of boosts him up to that unoccupied seat. So for a couple of months, Roosevelt has been moving the American Pacific fleet around, getting closer and closer to the Spanish possession of the Philippines. And he tells the uh, American commander of the Pacific fleet, uh, Admiral Perry, to be ready for war. So when war hits, the American fleet is going to sail into Manila Harbor and blow up the wooden Spanish Navy. There you see the flagship of that Navy, USS Olympia. When Perry will utter those famous words in American naval history, you may fire when ready, gridly. That ship, of course, the USS Olympia, is currently docked in Philadelphia and is uh, available for tours. So if you get a chance, uh, go to Penn's Landing and tour the USS Olympia. So the American Navy gets us off to a rather great start. But we now have the Philippines, and more about that in a minute. So uh, Admiral Dewey, did I say Perry? I'm sorry. Admiral Dewey captures me. And that will be our first move, not in Cuba, but again in the Pacific, largely as a result of Roosevelt preparing them for just such a move. In the meantime, in Cuba, American troops, well, our army, let's just say, was not ready for this. So there's a number of things that are going to happen. Very quickly, uh, number one, we had no way of getting there. So we are uh, building an army and we put it in Tampa and Tampa can't wait to get rid of the army because you got a bunch of guys sitting around with nothing to do. You have Teddy Roosevelt who resigns as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy and starts his own uh, little group called the Rough Riders. He will be uh, in command of that group with no military experience, by the way, uh, and uh, will garner the headlines throughout the war. There's one thing that Teddy Roosevelt knew how to do, and that was to capture not just a hill, as you see there, but how to capture headlines. And the most famous event in the Spanish-American War outside of the main, of course, will be the charge up San Juan Hill. But to get to San Juan Hill, they first had to get Kettle Hill. Now, the charge up San Juan Hill, uh, that was a little different. You see Roosevelt riding a horse up there, and in some of the later films that, per, uh, that portrayed that, in some of the famous paintings, uh, you see them all riding up on horses. First of all, that hill was so damn steep, you weren't going to ride a horse up there. Secondly, that made you the target for the Spanish who were ensconced on top of that hill. Now, the reason they wanted the hill, it looked down into Santiago Harbor, which is where uh, the Spanish fleet was maintained. So it was important to get that hill. Uh, one of the groups that, that helped lead it was a group of all black soldiers, uh, the United States Army Colored Troops, uh, known oftentimes as the Buffalo Soldiers, led by a white officer known as Colonel Pershing. They gave him the name Black Jack Pershing because he commanded black troops. We'll talk more about them in a minute. Let's take a look at that fictionalized charge up San Juan Hill. <laughs>
couldn't see it uh, at the end there, but there was a water tower, and on that water tower, they were going to run the American flag up after the completion of that battle, and on the water tower, it says, the American Sugar Company. Aha, dollar diplomacy. There is the uh, troop of Buffalo soldiers led by Black Jack Pershing, who will later command our army during World War I. They go up San Juan Hill. Uh, Roosevelt and his Rough Riders will leave, and then they will hold uh, after repeated attacks by the Spanish to try to take that hill. Yet there will not be one word about them in America's newspapers. It will all be about Colonel Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. <laughs> So Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Rider, is going to become a internationally renowned hero. Roosevelt is going to uh, nominate himself for the Medal of Honor, and it's given to him. The sinking of the United States battleship Maine in Havana Harbor and the rising belligerency of the Cuban people posing a threat to U.S. interests triggered the Spanish-American War. The war, lasting only a year, was dominated by the United States. The combined efforts of Admiral George Dewey's naval fleet and Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders enabled the United States to win decisive victories in Cuba and the Philippines, destroying the Spanish fleet. The Treaty of Paris in 1889 made Cuba an independent nation. In return, the United States ceded Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines for $20 million. Remember, tell a resolution. We didn't want anything out of this. So we blockade Cuba when Roosevelt and his uh, groups take San Juan Hill. They put cannons up there. That forces the Spanish Navy to go out into the ocean and fight the United States naval blockade. And of course, they will be sunk. And so. The United States wins, in a short period of time, really, the Spanish-American War. We are now considered to be a world power. We've just beaten one of the so-called world powers, when in fact uh, they were but a hollow shell uh, on the inside. And this the debate in the Senate over the Treaty of Paris was one of the great debates in the history of the U.S. Senate. Because it came at a time when almost everybody in the United States recognized that the United States was at a crossroads. It could continue in the direction that had gone from the beginning of its national existence, where it focused on events in North America, on events close to home. It remembered that it was a republic, it was a democracy. Or it could follow the lead of those 
people were saying that the United States needed to become an empire. This was at the heart of the question. If we embark upon a career of conquest, no one can tell how many islands we may be able to seize or how many races we may be able to subjugate. Neither can anyone estimate the cost, immediate and remote, to the nation's purse and to the nation's character. Anti-imperialists argued that empire building was inconsistent with the values of a democratic republic. They looked at the world around them and they saw that the great colonial empires were not democracies and they pointed to Germany and Japan and Russia and Britain and France and said, if you want America to look like that, then accept this course of imperialism. But if you want America to look like America, if you want to maintain America's unique position in the world, then do not take this colony because you might make America an empire, but you will destroy the American Republic. We want to send the products of our farms, our factories, and our mines into every market of the world. Make the foreign peoples familiar with our products. And the way to do that is to make them familiar with our flag. For those who favored empire, military and economic interests merged in the argument for annexing the Philippines. If the United States was going to be a great power, it had to have a great big navy. And in the days of steam-powered ships, Navies needed to have coaling stations, places overseas where fuel was waiting for them. And there was coal in the Philippines, and there were harbors in the Philippines that would make great coaling stations. So for those people who had this strategic sense, who dreamed of the China market, the Philippines were an obvious first step in that direction. It seems to me that God, with infinite wisdom and skill, is training the Anglo-Saxon race for an hour sure to come in the world's future. Religion, too, became part of the debate as the concept of manifest destiny was applied to Asia. At the time, you had many Americans determined that it was the burden of the white man to civilize the heathen Chinese, and you had missionaries heading out from all over. Um, interestingly enough, largely women missionaries, over 69% of the missionaries are women. Families that wouldn't have let their daughter travel to Chicago alone, let their daughters go to China to be missionaries. The idea of religion, of spreading a particular set of religious values, wasn't important to everybody. But as in all policy decisions in the United States, you don't have to get everybody signed on for the same reason. And if missionaries and their supporters form a small group advocating annexation of the Philippines, for example, as they did, you add that group with groups that are looking to the Philippines for economic reasons, groups that are looking to the Philippines for naval and strategic reasons, you add them all up and you get a majority. The Senate took the fateful step of accepting the Treaty of Paris, making the United States a colonial power, annexing the Philippines to the United States, and transforming the United States from a simple democracy into something more complicated, a democratic empire, if such a thing could exist. And the question was, could such a thing exist? So all of this is a direct result of the Spanish-American War. That war opened the door for us to become an imperialist power. Now, who were the people opposed to it? You heard in the film, uh, they talked about anti-imperialists. They were progressives. They were the progressives who felt that this was not the true calling of democracy. So the overall results of the war, well, it's simple. We're going to get, despite the Teller Resolution, territory. Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines. We are now thrust into the role of a world power and will compete with others for that title. The need for a canal, an inter-ocean canal linking the Pacific with the Caribbean. The rise of Teddy Roosevelt, and eventually it's going to thrust him into the presidency. As a result of Cuba gaining its quote unquote independence, you're going to have us help them write their own constitution. 
but we're going to attach something to that constitution called the Platt Amendment. And the Platt Amendment said that Cuba is independent, but any time, keep this in mind now, any time we feel that they are not being ruled properly, in effect, that we can intervene. Oh, and by the way, we also get a little uh, piece of their land, a little piece on the uh, southeastern portion of the Cuban island called Guantanamo, which of course we still hold today. And it's where we keep a lot of the suspected terrorists that we've incarcerated. And the development of something that Teddy Roosevelt will later call the big stick policy. And we'll discuss the meaning of that shortly. And a series of legal challenges to this, this road that we're on will be known as the insular cases. <laughs> Now, what are those insular cases? Well, you want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. What is the truth? What is the question? And it's simply this. Does the United States Constitution follow the flag? So in other words, anywhere where we plant our flag, on any island, any foreign country, does that mean then that the U.S. Constitution, which also includes the Bill of Rights, are they in effect? And of course, what the Supreme Court rules, the Constitution does not follow the flag. So we don't have to rule it the exact same way, nor give the people the same rights that they would experience were they living in the United States, even though these are now United States possessions. So the hands influence, you see them all circled down there, all the islands that we're going to take. And of course, one of the threats that we see to all of that, even in the late 19th century, is Japan. Of course, a threat which will realize itself in the middle of the 20th century. And to show Japan our power, we're going to send Now, this is going to be done by Teddy Roosevelt after he becomes an accidental president, after the assassination, of course, of McKinley. He takes the fleet and he sends it on a quote-unquote goodwill mission around the world. Well, they start out and Congress reacts, saying you were not authorized to do this. Uh, we're going to cut off the funding. You bring them back. So Roosevelt did. He brought them back the long way, meaning that to get back, number one, they're going to need money. And number two, he says, well, you're out there now. Come on home. And of course, what did they do? They circled the globe and came back. So he followed the rules, but not quite to a T. <laughs> various islands throughout the world in order to, again, project our power. And one example of a problem in projecting that power will be this ship. USS Oregon. USS Oregon was stationed in San Francisco. When the Spanish-American War starts, the Oregon receives a cable. The cable tells the Oregon to report to Cuba to assist with the blockade. She does, but keeping in mind that she's over here, she's got to go all the way down and around the horn, the tip of South America, then up and get to Cuba 
And she gets there about two days before the war's over. So we realize the necessity, even though we've talked about it for some time, of a canal. A canal, of course, would cut that distance. So the United States begins embarking upon a quest to build such a canal. And who is it that's going to push for that canal? Well, of course, none other than Teddy Roosevelt. We had had a treaty in 1850 called the Clayton Bulwer Treaty. And that treaty said that any canal that would be built would be built along with France, alongside of France. Well, we managed to extract ourselves from that. Then in 1901, we're going to try and we signed the Hay Pontsport Treaty, uh, which gives us the right to build a canal across Panama, which at that time was owned by Colombia. Kind of our version of the CIA takes an individual by Felipe Buna Varilla, and he's down there in Panama, and he provokes a revolution, a revolution to throw out Colombia and establish an independent Panama. Now, eventually, they are successful. Why? Because of the United States Navy, which stops Colombia from sending troops to put down that revolt. Uh, we'll talk about Walter Reed. That name, of course, has been a lot uh, in the news lately. Of course, that's where uh, Trump was uh, sent with the virus for a couple of days through Walter Reed Hospital. Walter Reed uh, is going to combat the single biggest problem in building the canal. And that, of course, was the yellow fever. And eventually, he realizes that the yellow fever was transmitted by mosquitoes. And uh, he and another doctor would put an end to that, uh, that death trap, if you will. The engineer is going to be Colonel Goethals. We're going to sign a new treaty, exactly the same as we had with Columbia prior to that, saying that we would uh, purchase the land for a few million dollars and pay them a quarter of a million dollars in rent every year. Really, it's quite a bargain. Columbia uh, is the one really that backs out of the treaty and Roosevelt goes to Congress and tells Congress, you can no more construct a treaty with the Colombians than you can nail jelly to a wall. And with that, the revolt takes place in 1903. That revolt, of course, uh, will be aided by American military. We're going to sign a new treaty and then, of course, uh, begin construction. That construction will be finished in 1914. There is Teddy Roosevelt. He will be the first president to leave uh, the continental United States while he's president. And he will, uh, with that uh, giant crane, dig some of the first dirt to construct the canal. You see there the, the length of the canal, aided by the fact, of course, that uh, much of the travel is through a lake, which of course they had to uh, make sure that was dredged properly and certain obstacles removed. But there they are linking the Atlantic Pacific, one of the engineering uh, marvels of all time. Initially, they wanted to, to build the, the canal up here uh, and they wanted a sea level canal. Uh, but that was, uh, as people later said, almost a physical impossibility. So putting it down there and using the lake and doing what you're about to see in this next film clip made all the sense in the world. I don't know if any of you ever traveled through the Panama Canal. Uh, a lot of cruise ships uh, will now go through it. And what you see here are some of the locks or steps that are used to transverse from one side to another. Take a look. Roosevelt could now picture how a ship would be lifted up to the lake through a series of locks like steps. The system was brilliant because it was so simple. Each chamber would fill by a flow of water from the lake above. 
The one force at work was simple gravity. No pumps were required. Roosevelt might have insisted on a sea level canal. It was what many in Washington wanted. But he listened to Stevens and well he did. Had the United States tried to build a sea level canal, the project almost certainly would have failed. The canal now becomes vital to our economy because again, we've just cut 6,000 miles off the trip and time is money, number one. Number two, it means that we no longer have to worry about having a two ocean Navy. Uh, we can send ships more easily back and forth. Uh, now, of course, today we have uh, a Navy for the Indian Ocean. We have a Navy for the Pacific Ocean, the Mediterranean fleet, the Atlantic fleet. Uh, but back in those days, economy was everything. So the canal becomes vital to our economic and our military interest. So we're going to do anything we can to defend that canal. It is a keystone. And as such, Roosevelt decides to add something to the Monroe Doctrine. And that's going to be called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And what the corollary simply said was that if we feel that there is uh, instability in an area which threatens the overall general well being of the entire region, then we can send troops in to intervene and restore uh, some type of stability. And of course, this was all meant to protect the canal. You can see there on that map uh, the different times that we would intervene. One of the uh, ironies is that when we first issued the Monroe Doctrine in 1824, we were considered to be a hero to the uh, Latin American and Central American people. After the corollary comes, of course, we become almost the enemy because of the number of times we're going to insert troops and assert our right to interfere in their domestic affairs. So, answer that question. Where does a 500 pound rooster sit? <laughs> Anywhere it wants. Again, we are a world power and we get to decide exactly how we're going to be treated. Now, what about Asia? What about the Far East? Well, again, we've got a number of things going on, all right? We've got, nope. And here we go again. We have religious interests, which of course uh, we've, we've discussed ad nauseum, but particularly in China and the Philippines. The Philippines though were largely Catholic by this time as a result of uh, Spanish control for such a long period of time. We're gonna practice one of the isms, colonialism. <laughs> the people of the Philippines who have been promised freedom when they helped us throw out the Spanish, now revolt led by an individual by the name of Emiliano Aguinaldo. And that insurrection is going to result in the death of close to 200,000 Filipinos. Uh, it becomes a precursor, actually, for our war in Vietnam. Of course, this is uh, primarily, we're talking about all of the uh, Asian countries now and the islands that we've taken in the Pacific for our defense. So we have to defend those islands. And of course, China. China, if you remember earlier, was being cut up into little pieces by various European powers. And we wanted a piece of that action. We wanted our own sphere of influence. And so we are going to get involved in China. We talked about Aguinaldo. He is going to be eventually captured. Uh, which will put an end to the insurrection. We're going to send William Howard Taft over there as the governor of uh, the Philippines. Of course, uh, 
Roosevelt brings him back to be the president of the United States eventually, uh, you know, succeeding him. And we've talked about, you know, all of those problems. Uh, we promise them that they will gain their independence in 1942. But of course, by that time, the Japanese had taken over. Uh, and once again, we will invade the Philippines, MacArthur, I shall return. And eventually, of course, they will be granted their independence around 1947. Or 46, maybe. So who gets China? China uh, was a sleeping giant. And each of those countries that you see portrayed there, either by the eagle or the French frog or the, the uh, Russian bear, uh, et cetera, et cetera, each of those are staking their claim to a part of China. Listen very carefully to this. Peking, China, the summer of the year 1900. The rains are late, the crops have failed. A hundred million Chinese are hungry, and a violent wind of discontent disturbs the land. Within the foreign compound, a thousand foreigners live and work, citizens of a dozen far-off nations. nations saying the same thing at the same time, we want China. That is set for quite some time. I want you to imagine this. In the 1840s, a war was fought between China and Great Britain. What was that war about? It's simple. Britain wanted to have the right to sell opium to China. Think about it. It's a drug war, two drug gangs. All of this is going to relieve or re, uh, result, if you will, in something simply known as the Boxer Rebellion. Boxer Rebellion had nothing to do with boxing gloves or boxer shorts, right? The Boxer Rebellion 
was on its face a, uh, a cultural revolt by the uh, Chinese people who called themselves boxers. They believed that if they wore red uh, and they fired their guns high, then their gods would guide their bullets to their destination. Uh, they would attack the foreign legations that you saw playing all the music there in Peking. Uh, they would hold out for 55 days until a foreign relief force came. Eventually, this rebellion uh, would be aided by the Chinese army itself. All of the, the emperor, the empress of China was behind this whole thing. Uh, eventually, the rebellion would be put down, and of course, rather stiff penalties would be uh, imposed upon China. We would institute something known as the open door policy. Get it? Doorbell, open door. Anyway, uh, we kind of felt guilty about this whole thing, so we gave a great deal of money to China in order for them to send their uh, children to schools in the United States. China uh, would agree to allow the foreign countries to stay. We would, uh, on its face, look very magnanimous when we say that every country should do away with its uh, spheres of influence and the whole country should be open. Yeah, open for what? Exploitation, of course. So it wasn't so magnanimous, if you will. The open door policy, giving everybody, if you will, a sphere of influence. When Taft becomes president, Taft will institute something known as dollar diplomacy, where American military power is going to be used to help America's big business. And Again, those two have been intertwined uh, as far back as one can remember. Wilson becomes president, talks about moral diplomacy. We're going to spread democracy. Well, that's the very same thing that George W. Bush tried to do. Uh, and of course, that gave us Iraq and ISIS and all of the instability that we now have in the Middle East um, atop the instability that was already there. And we'll talk about that moral diplomacy when we get to World War I. But we are now officially one of the guys. And that's a club you may or may not want to be part of. <laughs>
So we were then and we are now members of a shrinking world. And as the world shrinks, as we become closer and closer to one another, economically, militarily, obviously the pandemic is an example of it, uh, we cannot isolate. And therefore foreign policy becomes more important. I mean, think about it. Most of us are simply taking a look at what happens in our own backyards. Many of us are not interested in what goes on overseas or what we are doing until it directly impacts us vis via a war, uh, a draft, whatever the case may be. But it's no longer the case. What happens in one small far off country uh, begins a series of dominoes which has a direct impact on us. So we cannot afford to bury our heads in the sand. And this is when it all starts. This period of imperialism, colonialism, call it what you will, uh, becomes extremely important to the health and well-being of the American nation and, of course, of its individual people. So as you look at foreign policy then and you look at foreign policy now, keep in mind that it is a direct impact on your life and on your future. We'll take a look after this at World War I, but that's for another time in another place.